What made the Vikings tick? Our clearest window on the Vikings appears in the early writings of Iceland, primarily the sagas, the greatest vernacular literature of medieval Europe. These stories of kings and common heroes help bring that age to life in our imagination. The swan-breasted and swan-necked Viking longship fueled the Viking Age from 800 to 1066. An engineering marvel, these ships would carry merciless and relentless sea rovers from Norway west to the Orkneys, Iceland, Greenland and Lonzo Meadows in Newfoundland in the year 1000. The Viking craftsmen built the hull first, overlapping the planks in what is termed the clinker-built or lapstrake style, and the internal crossbeams were often tied to the ribs near the keel to provide added elasticity. They were the stealth bombers of the day. Skimming over the rough waves of the North Atlantic by sail or rode up a river, these versatile and sleek swans took the adventurous and warlike Norse to lands more promising than their own, and they hungered in time for new homes and sunnier climes with more fertile earth. According to the sagas, the unifying efforts of Harald Finehair, the first king of Norway, forced many freedom-loving Norwegians to set sail west, and some of these displaced Norwegians, both nobles and farmers, transplanted their democratic and literary heritage and habits in Iceland, a fortress of Norse culture. The best poets of the period were Icelanders, and some even served in the court of English kings, so similar were the related Gothonic languages. These poems often provide the skeleton on which the narrative of the sagas hang, and the intricate nature of these poetic compositions ensure that seeds of history abide in them. Viking poets used elaborate metaphors or kennings, so that the whale road was the ocean, and the fish of the forest a dragon. The greatest of these poets, Eat Skatla Grimson, stood head and shoulders above his Viking peers. Jesse Byock, in using science to illuminate the past, credibly suggests that this ugly and massive man suffered from an ailment called Paget's disease, that deformed and thickened his bones. It also lived the Viking life, and wrote of it with eloquence. Shipwrecked on the coast of England at the mouth of the Humber, It and his men find themselves near York, then ruled by his enemy Eric Bloodaxe, former king of Norway. Viewing it shameful to flee, he marches fully armed into the hall of Eric. The strong-willed queen Gunhilda suggests that they kill him outright, but it being night, that was viewed as a crime. So Eric bids it good night. Tomorrow he will die. A common friend, Aaron Bjorten, provides an unlikely way out. In the night, it must compose a poem of praise about his enemy, Eric. A head ransom poem. The next morning he recites his poem in a clear, strong voice. The entire head ransom poem appears in chapter 63 of the saga, a poem of 20 stanzas. Although Eit has killed kinsmen of the king and queen, he is set free. And this gets to something crucial about the minds of these men. The Vikings prized a matrix of four interconnected virtues above all, courage, honor, generosity, and loyalty. A curious blend of fearlessness and fatalism guided them to face inevitable death with stoic fortitude, an idea captured in the poem Havamal, the sayings of the high one. Cattle die, wealth dies, kinsmen die. You yourself must one day die, but word fame never dies for him who achieves it well. The poem promises immortality to Eric, so he frees the killer of his own son, an act of incredible generosity. To the east, the longships took the Swedish Russ, along rivers to build Novgorod and Kiev, the first towns in the country that would take their name, Russia. But the most highly contested prize was south, and in the Viking Age, Norwegians and Danes shocked the shores of Ireland, the United Kingdom, and France, a hammer from the north. The Norwegians created the first towns in Ireland, including Dublin, and the great Dane, Canute, 
the most capable king of medieval England, also ruled Norway and Denmark well. The Norse Normans took England with William the Conqueror in 1066, to end the Viking Age and to seed English with French and Latin words. But one more significant contribution remains. The eagerness of Vikings in the Dane law to communicate with their southern Anglo-Saxon neighbours produced a friction that led to the erosion of the complicated inflectional word endings, so that the English language increased in simplicity, clarity, directness, and strength. Professor Tom Shippey vividly explains the loss of grammatical word endings. Someone from south of the Dane law might say in Old English, Ik sella they that horse the dragoth min wagon. A Viking a bit north might say it this way, Ek mun selja der hrasset a dreger wagen min. With some words in common, they roughly understand each other. In time, the inflections melted away, and this remained. I'll sell you the horse that drags my wagon. This Viking-bred English dispensed from the north, insatiable in seeking distant shores, has a horde now of about one million words. Lastly, the Vikings soon turned swords into plowshares, and like all good immigrants, they quickly assimilated. <laughs>